the liberation of Paris was commemorated by the Allied Supreme Commander. Acting on behalf of the Allied forces, General Eisenhower presented the French capital with a shield of honor. The resting place of the French unknown soldier is restored. Once again, Frenchmen may honor their war dead at this famous shrine. The Supreme Commander's speech was a fitting tribute to the valiant French forces of the interior. Two weeks ago, French and Allied forces entered this city. We came to deliver the coup de grace to the last remaining elements of the enemy here. But the liberation of Paris had already largely been pleaded. A week before, the men of the French forces of the interior, who for four long years, inspired by General de Gaulle, had carried on a relentless struggle against the enemy, had risen in their wrath and gone into the streets to drive out the hated invaders. All members of the Allied force would like to pay their fraternal admiration to the people of Paris. On their behalf, I present to the city a shield. We hope that this simple object will forever recall the day of Paris's liberation. A small plaque was used at the ceremony for the eventual shield, now being designed by American artists. The city was proud indeed of this tribute to their intrepid resistance forces. The capture of Marseille came with breathtaking speed. French colonial troops were in the vanguard as citizens poured into the streets to greet their liberators. Formalities over, soldiers and populace joined in the festival of freedom. pleased by their sudden liberation were these Russian workers forced into slave labor by the Nazis. A parade in honor of the underground, the men and women who prepared the way for the victory, was staged in the old port of Marseille. Here as everywhere throughout France, the FFI had worked valiantly, weakening and harassing the enemy. General Tassigny, commander of the French forces under General Pat, was on hand. He presented the military medal to both men and women of the heroic underground forces. Although these are the first pictures of the restoration of Marseille, the Allies have since gone on from victory to victory. The second port of France has fallen. Once again, La Havre is an allied city. A final intensive bombing paved the way for the surrender of this vital communication center. Every single defensive position held by the stubborn German garrison was covered by target indicators. The work of tanks and bombers kept allied casualties to a minimum and ferreted out the 12,000 German defenders at small cost in Allied lives. Flame-throwing tanks opened the path for the ground forces. Almost nothing could withstand this formidable fire-eating weapon. The first patrols to enter the port picked their way carefully. The approaches were devastated while overcoming the enemy's stubborn but futile stand. The dock area, where German resistance was most determined, had to be reduced to rubble. 
Some of the harbor's destruction was the result of Nazi bombing during the Battle of France four years ago. At last, the German defenders made their choice, the choice now facing every soldier of the German Wehrmacht. That choice is death or surrender. Days earlier, the Albert Canal had been crossed, its vaunted defense system overcome in four days. No small part in this rapid triumph was achieved across the Bailey Bridge, which turned the partly demolished permanent bridges into highways for British armor. The capture of Brussels was followed almost immediately by the liberation of Antwerp. The 40 kilometers separating the two cities was covered in record time by the British Second Army. The Germans were given no respite to organize an effective defense. There was sharp street fighting in the valuable port, but that was all. The enemy was caught entirely off balance. This dockside railhead was among the last places taken by the British. With the estuary of the Scheldt River cleared of Nazis, another great continental port is available to the Allies. The people of Antwerp and the Belgian forces of the interior gave the Allies fullest possible aid. Arms and supplies were dropped to the Belgian White Army behind the German lines. This was a military operation that had proved so successful with a Maquis in France. Since D-Day and even before, this airborne supply policy had paid big dividends for all concerned. The arms were collected the moment they hit the ground. In very few hours, they were put to effective use by the men who had waited for years for this moment to strike. Back in Brussels, meanwhile, members of the Belgian government had flown in from London. Their first official appearance was made at the Brussels War Memorial in tribute to the capital's liberation. The people of Brussels gave Britain's great soldier, Field Marshal Montgomery, a tremendous reception. The rejoicing continued as the Field Marshal made his appearance on the balcony of the Hôtel de Ville. At the same time, the American 7th Army smashed forward to complete the liberation of Lyon. A few snipers held out in the huge hospital on the banks of the Rhone. Their fire was directed indiscriminately into crowded streets, but their last ditch stand was of short duration. Hospital patients were removed to safety until danger from fire was brought under control. The city was wild with joy as the French and American troops drove in. France's third city, Lyon has long been a main center of underground resistance. Here again, the now familiar scene was enacted. Collaborators were paraded through the streets in disgrace. One French city after another is being restored to freedom and liberty. No less than seven great and powerful allied armies are poised ready to march into Germany. And the whole world of free men joins in the sharing. Victory is at hand. 